Uh, hello! This will be a demonstration of Proposition 35 from Book 9 of Euclid's Elements, which says that if numbers be in a continued proportion, then the second number minus the first number is to that first number, just as the last number minus that first number is to the sum of all those numbers up to the last number. We're given four numbers, A, B, C, D, and E, F, which form a continued proportion, such that A is to B, C, just as B, C is to D, and just as D is to E, F. We're also, on the side, going to have the two numbers, B, G, and F, H, both equal to the number A. And what we want to prove is that the second number minus the first number is to the first number, just as the last number minus the first number is to the sum of all those numbers up to the last. In our particular example, what that's going to mean is that BC minus A, which we're going to call CG because we made BG equal to A. So this is really BC minus BG, which is just CG. So CG is to A, just as EH, which is EF minus FH, which is equal to EF minus A, is to A plus BC plus D. State that again. We want to prove that CG is to A, just as EH is to A plus BC plus D. We're going to begin by creating two numbers, FK and FL the first of which is equal to BC, and the second of which is equal to D. Now, because FK is equal to BC, that's how we made FK in the previous step, and we know from our given that FH is equal to BG for both of them are equal to the same number A, then we know from common notion three, we can subtract these equals from these equals and get that the remainder HK is equal to the remainder CG. Now, this next step is the hard one. There's a lot going on here, so I'm going to take it slowly. We know that EF, D, BC, and A form a continued proportion. We were given that. We know that EF is to D, just as D is to BC, and just as BC is to A. And we have numbers which are equal to D, BC, and A. So we're going to substitute those into our continued proportion, which of course we know we can do by a property of numbers. We know D is equal to FL. We know BC is equal to FK. And we know A is equal to FH. So we're going to plug all of those into our continued proportion to get that EF is to FL just as FL is to FK, and just as FK is to FH. Now, Euclid sums this next part into a single step, which he calls separando. I'm going to break it apart a little bit, actually. So let's begin just by taking EF to FL, just as FL is to FK. Now, what we have here is that a whole is to a whole, just as a part subtracted is to a part subtracted. Because we can understand FL as a subtracted part of EF and FK as a subtracted part of FL. So we have something that satisfies the conditions for Proposition 711, which says that if, as a whole is to a whole, so a part subtracted is to a part subtracted, then the whole is to the whole, just as the remainder is to the remainder. So because EF is to FL, just as FL is to FK, we can say that the remainder EL is to the remainder LK, just as the whole EF is to the whole FL. But we know EF is to FL, just as FL is to FK. So we have two ratios which are the same with the same ratio. So a or property of numbers tells us that they are the same with one another, so that EL is to LK, just as FL is to FK. Now, the last thing we're going to do, we're going to alternate this proportion. So because EL is to LK, just as FL is to FK, we're going to alternate this by Proposition 713 and say that EL is to LF, just as LK is to FK. So that's how he ultimately gets separando. It's by a use of Proposition 711, then a property of numbers, and then Proposition 713. So that's how he gets that EL is to LF, just as LK is to FK. And we can do this exact same thing for the second half of this continued proportion, 
We can do the separando step for FL to FK as FK is to FH to get that LK is to FK just as KH is to FH. So in totality, what we're gonna say is that EL is to LF just as LK is to FK and just as KH is to FH. Now the last thing we're gonna do with, with this step is apply proposition 712. That one tells us that if you have a bunch of ratios which are the same with one another, then as one antecedent is to one consequent, so the sum of the antecedents is to the sum of the consequents. So we're gonna add up our antecedents E, L, L, K, and K, H together, and we're gonna add up our consequents L, F, F, K, and F, H. So that what we get in the end is that the one antecedent K, H is to the one consequent F, H, just as the whole EH, for EH is the sum of EL, LK, and KH, EH is the sum of all of our antecedents, is to LF plus FK plus FH. I'll say that again. The one antecedent KH is to the one consequent FH, just as the sum of the antecedents EH is to the sum of the consequence LF plus FK plus FH. Now, this last step is going to be simple substitution because we know all of these numbers are equal to our given numbers. We know that KH is equal to CG. We proved that in our second step. We know that FH is equal to A. We were given that. And we also know that FK is equal to BC. We know that from our first step. And finally, that LF is equal to D. We again know that from our first step. So this last thing we're going to do, this final step, we're just going to plug all of those in and say ultimately that CG is to A just as EH is to A plus BC plus D. And this is exactly what we set out to prove, which means we're done with the proposition, therefore, etc. QED. This is one of the most, in my opinion, extraordinary propositions of Euclid's entire number theory. This and the next proposition, which I'm excited to get into, are simply fascinating. They're brilliant. This is what Euclid's number theory has been building up to. So I'm very excited to be talking about this proposition, and I'll be even more excited to talk about the next one, but I'll stick with this one for now. The importance of this proposition is that it gives us a way to sum up the terms of a continued proportion. I'll give an example to start off. We know that 8, 12, 18, and 27 form a continued proportion. For 8 is to 12, just as 12 is to 18, just as 18 is to 27. So what this proposition is going to tell us is that the second number 12 minus the first number 8 is to the first number 8, just as 27, which is our last number, is to our minus our first number 8, is to the sum of 8 plus 12 plus 18. For this just one occasion, I will use fractions instead of ratios, just because uh, not only does that make it easier to read for a modern audience, but it also gives a smoother transition to how we represent this proposition nowadays. So our second number 12 minus our first number 8 is to our first number 8 just as our last number 27 minus our first number 8 is to 8 plus 12 plus 18, which are all the numbers in the continued proportion up to 27. <laughs> Said all that very quickly. Um, if you didn't get all that, it really doesn't matter. I just want to give a particular example of what this proposition looks like. Now, if you do all the arithmetic, uh, you'll see that this holds. So this proposition does hold. Now, if I were to put this in general notation, so not using the particular example of 8, 12, 18, and 27, but instead I had some arbitrary continued proportion, how I'm going to represent that, or how it's classically represented, is you have the number a, and you give it the subscript of 1. Then the next term of the sequence will be a subscript 2, and you'll just keep going like this, and we're going to keep going like this, until we hit a n minus 1, a sub n, and then a sub n plus 
one. So let's say we have a continued proportion of this form. Then what this proposition is gonna tell us is that the second number, a sub two, minus our first number, a sub one, divided by our first number, a sub one. This is equal to our last number, a sub n plus one, minus our first number, a sub one, divided by a sub one plus a sub two, and we keep going all the way up until we get a sub n minus one plus a sub n. So all the terms of the, of the continued proportion up to a sub n plus one. This is the general form of what this proposition is gonna look like, of course, in modern notation. Now, the best part about this proposition, the really important part, is that the, we can solve for the sum of a geometric progression or a continued proportion up to the nth term because we can write this bottom term here of a sub one plus a sub two all the way up to a sub n minus one plus a sub n. We can isolate that. And if we isolate it, what we get is that a sub one plus a sub two plus, and we just keep going until we get a sub n minus one plus a sub n. And this itself is just written as a shorthand, capital S sub a. That's just the shorthand S for sum. <laughs> Most things in math don't make sense. Writing, <laughs> abbreviating sum with an S, that does make sense, uh, which is always happening. Oh, great. So this, if we isolate that term there, what we're gonna get is we're gonna have a sub one multiplied by a sub n plus one minus a sub one all over a sub two minus a sub one. This is how you sum up a continued proportion or a geometric progression or a geometric sequence up to its nth term. You take the first term, multiply it by the difference of the next term where we to continue the proportion subtracted from the first term and you divide all of that by the second term minus the first term. Now, one final twist I'll put in here and I'll just write it down very briefly, but if you want more of an explanation, I'd be more than happy to give it in the comments section, is that when you see this written in say textbooks nowadays, you won't see it written with this notation. You'll see it with the modern notation of a, a continued proportion or a geometric progression, which we often write as a, then the next term is a r, then a r squared, then a r cubed, where r is the ratio consistent between each term and the next. And the reason we just add one to its exponent is so that each term can always have the same ratio to the next one. So that's just modern notation. Um, so I'm going to write this very briefly in its modern notation. So again, say we had um, S uh, sub N, like this, which here I'm gonna write as A plus A R plus A R squared, plus all the way up to A R to the N, like that. Then how we can represent this is as a multiplied by rn minus one, all divided by r minus one. Again, I won't explain where exactly, or I mean, you'll probably be able to figure it out itself, just based on how we go from this notation of the subscript of n to the um, a r notation. You can probably figure that out for yourself, but if you can't, again, more than happy to explain it in the comment section. But the point is that what this proposition gives us is it gives us a way to take the sum of a continued proportion up to an arbitrary term. And this is exactly how you would get it. If you were to do the subscript language, it would look like this, but if you were to do the r, um, if you were to write it with the r's, it would look like this. Um, so this is just a really important thing in number theory to be able to do. This comes up so much 
and it's gonna come up in the next proposition, 936, which I am so excited to demonstrate, not only because it's the last proposition of Euclid's number theory, and I've been doing this since, I don't know how long, about half a year at this point, uh, so I do just kind of want to be done with number theory, but also because it is exceptionally beautiful. We get the powers of two. We get the sum of a geometric uh, progression or a continued proportion, and we get our only mention of perfect numbers, that last definition of book seven. It finally comes up in this very last proposition. So I'm excited to demonstrate, and I hope you're excited to, to see it. With all of that said, I'm going to end the video here and move on to that proposition 936.